How's it going, guys? We have a medium difficulty question for pharmacology for step one and step two, nearly identical question. Shows up in one of the Neuro Clinical Mastery Series forms for 2CK. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical, links down below. Find me on Telegram, links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. And I start the clip. 66-year-old man, three-month history of falls. He has coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and osteoporosis. He takes metformin, verapamil, alendronate, medical permit, and lisinopril. Physical examination shows infrequent blinking and diminished facial expression. Cogwheel rigidity is seen at both wrists. He walks with short shuffling steps. Mental status examination shows no abnormalities, which the following is the next best step in pharmacologic therapy. So let's just whip to the answer choice here. Choice A, add carbidopa, levodopa to current regimen, wrong fucking answer. So this patient does not have Parkinson's disease. So I'm hopping right out of the gate and saying that. So for those of you who are thinking about adding current drugs and you're saying, well, adding current drugs, the fuck am I saying? Adding new drugs to the current regimen, then you'd be gestating, like, which one do we add first, OMG? US Assembly doesn't give a fuck, okay? They're not going to really force you into that position. What I can tell you that's high yield for US Assembly, uh, they want you to know uh, why carbidopa and levodopa are paired together. You just need to simply know that carbidopa, the presence of it, allows for more levodopa to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's simply it. We don't need to discuss the mechanism any further. You also need to know, and this is notable on 2CK, albeit a little bit weird, is that carbidopa levodopa can cause psychosis. Okay, so this act, because this is potentiating the effects of dopamine, right? Levodopa in the cross the blood brain barrier and then levodopa converted to dopamine, etc. This can cause a transient psychosis if the dose is inadvertently too high. So what they'll do on 2CK is tell you that uh, carbidopa levodopa was added to the patient's regimen and the patient now has auditory hallucinations and they say, what do you do? Discontinue carbidopa levodopa is the wrong fucking answer. The answer is decreased dose. Okay, so you just need to know that that can happen sometimes with carbidopa levodopa. You don't need to discontinue it. Okay, you're just going to simply decrease the dose. Wrong fucking answer. Ropinerol, wrong answer. So a lot we can talk about. Ropinerol, primapexil, obviously. Pergolide, uh, different agents that are D2 uh, agonists, D2 receptor agonists for Parkinson's disease. Ropinerol, primapexil can also be used for restless leg syndrome. Uh, gabapentin, new first-line agent, but you should know D2 agonists can also be used for restless leg syndrome. Bromocryptine, classically, for uh, prolactinoma. Wrong fucking answer. Selegiline, wrong answer. This is going to inhibit monoamine oxidase B, so it's going to prevent the breakdown more preferentially of dopamine. Okay, now I can tell you not just the mechanism of action, but a high yield point about selegiline that they ask in the step one NBMEs is this can cause serotonin syndrome, which makes sense. So if a patient is on an SSRI, if a patient's going to be taking uh, any uh, St. John wort, Okay, that can cause serotonin syndrome. You don't want to give monoamine oxidase inhibitors in that setting. Okay, so just be aware that this can cause serotonin syndrome. They ask it on uh, the NBME for step one, even though this preferentially prevents breakdown of dopamine, you still uh, don't want to give it if a patient's on an SSRI. Point is, wrong fucking answer. Now, which drug are we going to discontinue? OMG. So discontinue alendronate, wrong answer. So bisphosphonate, you should know that bisphosphonates are third line for osteoporosis. So weight-bearing exercise first. Long walks is correct over swimming. Second is vitamin D plus calcium. Third is going to be a bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonates inhibit osteoclast activity. You assembly wants you to know that mechanism. Okay, so alendronates, exogenous alendronates. The fuck am I saying? Like totally cracked out. So bisphosphonates, such as alendronate, they are going to... Uh, inhibit osteoclasts exogenously as a pharmacologic agent. Endogenously, calcitonin also inhibits osteoclast activity. What U.S. Assembly wants you to know is that bisphosphonates can cause pill-induced esophagitis, burning in the throat uh, with consumption. Okay, so patient needs to remain upright for at least a half an hour afterward, drink plenty of water. Okay, that is extremely high yield for family medicine. Knowing that bisphosphonates and potassium supplements can cause pill-induced esophagitis, students get hysterical about osteonecrosis of the jaw because it sounds weird. Exceedingly low yield for Yosemite. Wrong fucking answer. Choice B, discontinuement. 
choice B. Literally, crack the fuck out right now, okay? Choice B, second choice of these discontinue answers. Uh, discontinue at four and wrong answer. So this would be correct if we had low bicarb or high creatinine in a question. Okay, so metformin can cause lactic acidosis. So normal creatinine, 0 0.7, 1.2. Uh, upper limit of normal for what's acceptable to give metformin, 1.4. I've seen on NBME exams, but you simply won't really make it borderline. If they, if you get a question where give you a big fucking paragraph, lots of lab values, patients, creatinine's 2.2, discontinue metformin. Same deal, big fucking paragraph, lots of lab values, bicarb's 20, normal range 22 to 28, discontinue metformin. Wrong fucking answer. Discontinue metoclopramide, correct answer. So metoclopramide, it's prokinetic slash antiemetic, can be used for diabetic gastroparesis. It's a D2 antagonist. It also has antagonistic effects of serotonin 5-HT3, agonistic effects of serotonin 5-HT4, but it's a D2 antagonist. And US simply loves that. They love you knowing that this has the same side effects as the antipsychotics, which are D2 antagonists. So it can prolong the QT interval. It can cause extra pyramidal side effects. You can get tardive, dyskine tardive dyskinesia from metoclopramide. You can get Parkinsonism, akathisia, acute dystonia. Okay, so metoclopramide, D2 antagonist, holy shit. So that's what this is, theoretically. Okay, so you say, well, how do you know? How, how are you convinced that it's specifically a metoclopramide? Okay, well, the first thing we're going to do is just we look at the patient's meds and we say, okay, medical is there. We're going to discontinue it. See how the patient responds to that initially. Before we jump on the conclusion that the patient has Parkinson's disease, why don't you just discontinue the metoclopramide for a few weeks, see if the patient's situation ameliorates slash improves, and that's our next best step in management, polypharmacy, okay, high-yield uh, issue for U.S. Somalia family medicine in particular. Real quick, discontinue verapamil, wrong answer. So verapamil, you need to know, causes constipation. Okay, so non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, or nodal calcium channels can be used for atrial fibrillation sometimes for rate control. But constipation, ultra fucking high yield. Don't confuse with the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as nifedipine and lodipine, which cause fluid retention slash peripheral edema act on uh, systemic arterioles. Wrong fucking answer. You know the deal. I'm going to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. I appreciate your time. That's it.